I was home alone for the week, as my family had gone on vacation while I had to stay and work. It was around 2 a.m. and I'd stayed up to watch a scary movie in the dark in my basement. Suddenly, I heard footsteps on the first floor. This commonly occurred when my family was home. Every time they passed through the front hallway, past the basement door, I heard their footsteps. This time, I got scared. I turned the television off immediately. I heard the basement door handle click and turn as I sat in absolute darkness. I moved slowly and crawled behind our large television. As I passed it inch by inch, I noted with panic that its black screen still dimly glowed. I heard footsteps coming down the carpeted but creaky stairs. I froze in my hiding place, listening. For many long minutes, I heard nothing. Had the intruder seen the television's afterglow, or had it faded in time? Was he standing in the pitch dark listening for me? I seemed to lie there in total silence for a long time. My panic began to fade, and I began to think more clearly. Had I really heard an intruder? Could someone possibly be standing there in silence for so long without making any noise? If there was an intruder, he was still in the basement. I began counting in my head, trying to pass the time. As drool fell from my mouth onto the carpet, I didn't dare risk the sound of swallowing. I reached sixty seconds once, twice, thirty times, sixty times. By now my fear had faded, and I was more confused than anything. I estimated I'd been crouched in the absolute black for almost two hours, and had still heard nothing. If there was an intruder, none of this made sense. Finally, I decided I'd have to make a move. If I did nothing, eventually the sun would come up and shine in through the small basement windows. And worse, I began to smell something horrible. I moved slowly toward the stairs, sticking close to the walls to avoid anyone in the dark. The bad smell got worse, making me wonder if something had died nearby, because no living person smells like that. Finally, I approached the stairs. Suddenly there was a loud crash, like something big had fallen down. Without thinking, I started running out through the open basement and front doors. I knew for sure that someone was in the house now. I called the police from my phone and waited outside, watching my house nervously from a safe distance. The police came, checked inside the house, and then immediately came back out to question me. They'd found a body in the house. My elderly neighbor, who seemed to have died of a heart attack. Their belief was that I must have left the front door unlocked, and he must have wandered in my house while dying, looking for help. At first, I felt horrible, thinking that I had sat there in the dark while the old man literally died a few feet away. I suddenly thought what was that sound of loud crash that made me run out of the house. When I asked the police, they told me something scary. The back door was also left open, and there was a footprint in the mud. Somehow there was someone else in the basement with us, silent and waiting in the dark, right next to the old man's body. When I was a kid, my grandma and I moved to Washington. Our apartment complex was kind of scary, and the people who lived there weren't very friendly. We hardly knew anyone, and the ones we did know were either weird or up to no good. Our building had a big basement with laundry machines and storage rooms for each apartment. It was always creepy down there with weird sounds and echoes bouncing off the walls. Plus, the heater made scary noises, like a cat crying, and everything there was odd and scary. My grandma never let me go down there alone when I was little. She said it wasn't safe, and she was probably right. A lot of strange stuff happened in that basement, people doing bad things or leaving behind weird stuff when they moved out. But as I got older, I had to start helping out more around the house. So... When I was about 15, my grandma asked me to move some old furniture down to our basement storage room. I didn't like going down there, but I had to do it. That's when I heard it. A strange knocking sound, like someone tapping on the walls. It was different from the usual noises, and it gave me a weird feeling. I told my grandma about it, and she said it sounded like the SOS signal in Morse code, which is a way to ask for help. We went back down to the basement to investigate, and the knocking was still there. We decided to call the police, just in case. They came and checked every storage room, and that's when they found her, a young woman trapped in a hidden room behind a big closet. 
It turned out she had been there for days, suffering and scared. The person who had trapped her was someone who lived in the apartment above us. He was doing terrible things to her, and she needed help. I felt scared and sad knowing that something so awful was happening right under our noses. But I was also glad we found her and could get her help. It was a reminder that sometimes scary things can happen in unexpected places, and we have to look out for each other. I was up north, far north British Columbia, Canada, working in an oil rig camp out in the woods. I was working as a cook and I was given a separate cabin there. There was another cook with me, but at that time, he had gone on leave for a few days. One day, I went out of my cabin for a smoke on the back side of my cabin. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was a very quiet, still winter day. It was snowing those kind of big snowflakes that make it look like the world is moving in slow motion. So as I was standing there smoking, just staring off in the distance, not looking at anything particular, you know, looking left, right, up down at my feet, what for? I felt something looking at me. Then I looked straight ahead. About thirty feet or less in front of me was the tree line of the forest, and directly in front of me, in between two trees, I see the most gigantic wolf I have ever seen. This thing sitting looked like it was the size of a man standing. It was massive, sitting there and just staring right at me. We locked eyes, then I slowly started baking away. At the same time, Wolf also started coming towards me. But before he attacked me, I hurried into my cabin. I was scared, and even in such cold I started sweating. But when I looked through the window, he was gone. Out of fear, I called some other workers there so that we could sleep together in my cabin. And for our protection, we also kept knives and sticks with us. We were just laying down to sleep that we heard the sound of something moving. No doubt he was a wolf. Suddenly, we realized that we forgot to lock the cabin's door. Suddenly, we felt the wolf pounding its nails on the door and none of you dared to lock the door. We were all standing ready with knives and sticks in our hands when suddenly the door opened and the wolf came in and attacked us. Without thinking, we also attacked him with our sticks and knives. The wolf was badly injured and ran away. But sadly, two of our workers were also slightly injured. But thankfully, being together saved us from a huge loss of life. As soon as the morning light came, they were shifted to the nearest hospital, and thankfully, that wolf never came back. After many years, I still feel this creepiness that what would have happened if the rest of the workers were not with me that night? What could that wolf done to me if I had been there alone? Once there was a British who was driving through Ireland as the weather got progressively worse and day soon turned to night. He suddenly realized that he was on the wrong road but there was nowhere to turn around, so he pressed on, barely able to see the road through the rain. Without warning, his car just died. No battery, no engine. He assumed water must have shorted something and he'd best start walking. He was soaking wet in a hundred yards, but he continued walking. An hour later, he heard a noise behind him and turned to see a car coming very slowly up the road behind him, its lights very dim. As it reaches him, he reaches out through the torrential rain and opens the back door and jumps in. He was shocked when he saw that he is the only person in the car. There is no one driving and no other passengers. He freezes with fear as the car slowly continues up the road through the pouring rain. Before long, a village comes into view and the car creeps silently and slowly into the village. The British spies a pub so he jumps out and runs inside, not looking back. Panting with horror, he orders a beer and sits down. A minute later, two soaking wet Irishmen come into the pub. The taller one points at the British and says, That's him, Paddy. That's the bastard I saw jump out of the car we were pushing. When I was about 19 year old, I was driving on a two-lane road after work around 11 p.m. No other cars on the road. I was listening to the music and enjoying driving and suddenly a guy in a red shirt on a bicycle swerved from the side of the road right in front of my car. I hit him. 
felt the impact. I was yelling OMG over and over and got out of the car to see how badly he was hurt. Only I didn't see him. I couldn't find the guy. No bike, no red-shirted guy, no dent or blood on my car. I searched the ditch with a flashlight. A couple people passed by while I was looking in the field for a body, and then suddenly a sheriff's car pulled up. I told him what happened. He said I didn't hit anyone. Told me that about 15 years earlier, a young man in a red shirt was hit by a car while riding his bike right there. He died instantly. Deputy told me that every couple years someone driving through there believes they've hit a red-shirted bike rider. I'd hit a ghost. Yes, this is a true story. It happened about 40 years ago and it still creeps me out. To this day, I don't like driving at night. I was driving through eastern Washington on some state roads. There were no rest stops or cities, but I had done the route enough to know there were these massive dirt areas every approximately 40 miles where you could park safely away from the road. I decided to call it a night and closed my blinds and laid down to watch something on my phone. After roughly an hour, I hear someone try to open the driver's side door. I haven't heard any vehicles on the road the whole time I'm parked, but I get up to peek out the curtains. As I'm looking out into the blackness of the driver's side window, I hear them try the passenger side door. I peek down from the top of the curtain, but can't see anything, so I start the truck and kick on the lights. I'm fairly freaked out at this point, so I'm still not opening the curtains, but peeking through gaps. Nothing. Nobody is standing near either of my doors or parked within sight line. I take a deep breath and close the sleeper curtains, too, because for some reason that's going to make things better, right? After laying back down and convincing myself that something blew against the truck and it only sounded like the doors, I hear what sounds like someone trying to pry open the vents on the sleeper. The door handles start clicking again, and the truck starts shifting like someone is climbing on it. I hit the little alarm button in the sleeper, hoping to spook them off, but it does nothing but add to the noise of door handles, fingers tapping on windows and chassis, and the hiss of air coming out of the suspension. Then suddenly, it stops. A few moments where I can only hear myself breathing and my heart pounding before I hear another truck approach and then drive by. I spent the next few hours waiting for whatever it was to come back, but it never did. In the morning, I couldn't find any footprints or damage to my truck, but on every window were tiny human-looking handprints, like a toddler had licked their hand and stuck it to my window over and over. Not technically a truck driver, but I used to work as a field technician in the oil industry, so I spent a lot of time driving through remote areas of Canada at odd hours. One very strange and eerie experience sticks with me. I was in either northeast BC or northwest Alberta, can't remember the exact location, driving late at night when I noticed a very large black shape on the road in front of me. Thinking it was a moose, I stepped on the brakes, coming to a stop only a few feet from it. Despite being so close and having my headlights shining directly on it, I still couldn't tell what I was looking at. It was vaguely the shape of a four-legged animal, but very big, probably about six feet tall. Aside from that, it was completely featureless. I couldn't make out any details whatsoever, no shine from its eyes, nothing. And then I noticed there were more of them in the ditch on both sides of the road. Five or six, or maybe more, all the same as the black shape on the road in front of me. None of them were moving. They didn't look like physical objects or living things, more like just large patches of absolute darkness. After I got over my shock, dread started to set in, and I drove around the thing on the road and sped off. I don't really believe this was a paranormal experience. I'd been driving for more than eight hours through the middle of the night, and I was exhausted. Most likely it was a hallucination caused by lack of sleep and spending too long staring straight ahead into the dark. But it was still a very unsettling experience. The story is about a girl and her friend Megan, who were 11 years old and working on a science project for school. At one point during the project, her mom had told them that they would have to finish it later, as they had to run an errand at Walmart. She said that she didn't like them staying home alone as she thought they were too young. The girl's mother was overprotective of them, 
so they decided to go to the nearby store. She asked her mom if Megan and I can go into the toy aisle. Surprisingly, the mother gave the okay and even handed them a $20 bill to buy whatever they wanted, and she and her friend Megan went to look for a toy. As they're looking, they saw a store employee came up to them, and he asks them if they needed help. She asks him if he had any sort of puzzles around, and he points to the direction of the other aisle. She give him a friendly thanks and go to the aisle and look through the puzzles. About ten seconds go by and girls. Then see him enter the aisle where he bends down and casually puts his hand on her shoulder and asks, So, did you girls find what you were looking for? She thought that it was a little strange. The girl thought it was strange, but in her eleven-year-old state, she didn't feel threatened. She thought it was a friend trying to be friendly or give them more help. She tell him that they were fine and that they were just looking, but thanked him for his help. He then said it was no problem, and to not hesitate to ask him if they needed anything else. As he said this, he begins to slowly rub her back before getting up and leaving to another aisle. At this point, she was a little creeped out as well as Megan, and told her that they should just leave, that's exactly what they did, and they make their way over to the line where her mom had been checking out, as they're waiting in the checkout line, they see that employee walk past them, giving them a smile and even a gentle wave. The line thankfully moved forward, and they bought their things and left the store to go home. About a week later, during lunch at school, she was looking through her Instagram, where she mainly posted pictures of her dog. When she see a few comments from a user she didn't recognize, after further searching the comments, she had gone to the account and saw posts of that same Walmart employee. She have no idea how he found her Instagram, as she keep it private and don't let anyone follow her unless she knew them. As a matter of fact, she don't even remember accepting his request or if he even requested to follow her. In the first place, she blocked the account and thankfully never heard from him again. My family used to go camping with a few groups of friends when I was a kid. I remember one Christmas when I was about five, we were camping out in a forest in deep woods. There were nine kids in total at our campsite. We were allowed to wander through the forest. The parents would give us a walkie-talkie to tell us when to come back to camp, but we never wandered far. On the way, the walkie-talkie fell from us somewhere, and we got busy playing. After a while, we remembered that we didn't have the walkie-talkie, so we started looking for it. After searching, we found it fallen in one place. And while picking it up, an unfamiliar voice came over our walkie-talkie. It was a man's voice. He said he was Santa, and that he was trying to find us to give us our presents, and asked us to look for him. And as soon as we reached our campsite, we saw that there was no one there, and the walkie-talkie was there on the ground. We got scared, and suddenly we saw a man standing far away, staring at us. And suddenly, he started walking towards us. We started running back from there, and started calling our parents loudly. And as soon as we reached the place where we were playing, we saw our parents there and we rushed and hugged them and told them in a very scared voice that someone was following us. But when we looked back, no one was there. Then they asked us, where's your walkie-talkie was? We heard Santa's voice on it and quickly left to find you. That's when we told them that our walkie-talkie had fallen somewhere. But as soon as we found it, we also heard Santa's voice and we went back to get our gifts but there was no one there except a scary person. And as soon as he saw us, he started chasing us. After hearing this, everyone got scared and quickly packed their bags and went back home. After that day, we never thought about camping in the forest. When I was a kid, I lived with my grandma because my parents didn't have much money. My mom divorced when I was little, but she remarried soon after. Eventually, my parents bought a new house, but I chose to stay with my grandma because I liked the neighborhood and had friends there. Later, my grandma passed away, so I thought it would be a good idea to live with my mom and stepdad for a while. So, I moved into the basement of my mom's house. The basement had a nice setup, with an entertainment room and a wet bar that my stepdad had built. But soon after moving in, I started feeling something strange. Every night I felt like something was watching me, especially near the wet bar. 
made me feel scared and uncomfortable. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but the feeling kept getting stronger. It felt like whatever it was, it was getting closer to me. I tried different things to make it stop. I left doors open for light, thinking it might help, but it didn't. The feeling just kept getting worse, like it was trying to get into my room. It made it hard for me to sleep. I tried using a nightlight, hoping it would help me feel safer, but it didn't make a difference. The feeling of being watched continued, and it felt like it was getting stronger every night. One night, I finally saw something. It was my mom, crouched down in the middle of my room, staring at me with a strange smile on her face. I was terrified. I couldn't understand why she was there or what she wanted from me. I locked myself in my room and tried to forget about it, but I couldn't. The next day, my mom acted like nothing had happened. It was as if she didn't remember being in my room at all. I was too scared to confront her about it, so I tried to pretend like everything was normal. Finally, I got married and decided to move to a new place. I thought it was all over. But then I got a strange note from my mom at my wedding saying, I'll always be with you. It gave me chills. Even after my wedding, I woke up one night and I saw that my mom was trying to open my door at my new place. It was like the scary feeling never went away. It made me wonder what was really going on with my mom. I was hiking across Newfoundland, following an old railway that was long ago disassembled and turned into a giant trail, sleeping wherever I found myself at night. One day I ran into a small cottage town, except everything was abandoned. Trailers falling apart, bus conversions burnt out, small cabins all shuttered up. It was creepy but interesting at the same time. The sun was waning, so I decided to set up camp in a mostly empty lot that had an abandoned truck slowly falling into a ravine near it. Cooked up some food and crawled into my tent to sleep. I wake up sometime in the night and I hear footsteps outside my tent. At first I think it's an animal, but the steps sound like someone walking, a human. The steps get closer and go around my tent. I slowly and quietly pull out my dagger. If he tries to get in, my plan is to stab first and ask questions later. Anyone trying to get into my tent at night in the middle of nowhere is looking to do some kind of harm. My heart is racing at this point, but I try to just be quiet. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps stopped at the front side of my camp. After a while, a man of terrible appearance entered the camp. And as I said, I attacked him with my dagger without asking. But he dodged back so nimbly as if he knew I was going to attack him. And then he started trying to distract me from his words. That I was just passing by here and I saw your camp here. Leave your dagger and come out. I will not harm you. But I understood that he was telling a lie. Why would a person pass through here at such a late night without any reason? So I also started questioning him, and at the same time started putting my stuff in the bag. And then I pushed him away with a jerk and started running down the trail to get the hell out of there without seeing behind. I ran until daytime, came across a road and flagged down a truck. That guy was nice and drove me to town where I got a hotel. Even today, many years later, when I think about this incident, I get a shiver in my body that I don't know who that person was and what he was doing there at that time of night. But I'm glad he didn't come after me. Once I was driving through the Canadian Rockies late at night and had just passed through a small town. So I was driving through the pitch black and I need to stop to pee and have a smoke. But because it's so dark, I missed the last rest stop for the next while. But no problem, the highway was completely deserted. So I pulled to the side of the road, have my pee while staring out into the dark, and then light up a cigarette and stand by my car. As I was standing there, I saw the figure of a man just walking out of the tree line. I was miles from civilization, patchy cell service, and there isn't a soul on the road. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, and maybe it was a deer, but nope, this was a man. So I calmly walk back to the driver's door and get in, locking the doors behind me. I was keeping my eye on this guy as I nervously smoke and have my car in drive, ready to peel out. 
but for some reason I just stayed put. The guy walked right up to my passenger door and knocked on the window. I cracked the window and I asked what's up. He replied to me in a very, very serious tone. I need you to call the cops. I cautiously ask why, and he tells me he had gone out into the woods to kill himself, but he couldn't go through with it because he had thought of his daughters right before he was about to do it. I call the cops while the guy quietly cries outside. He had a kitchen knife that he was going to use on himself, so I stayed in the car and advised him to maybe leave the knife on the ground before the cops arrived. The cops came and got him, but before they left with him, I gave him a solid heart to heart and wished him well. I still think about him. I hope he was able to turn things around. I went to USC. I was in a dorm as my home state is about 17 hours from there. Every night would end the same with me finishing classwork or editing videos for a little bit of side money for YouTubers or kids who post to Instagram. Every night I would finish and hop in the shower. It was all the same every night. There was one night, though, I will never forget. I was showering and I heard my front door creak open as it always did when it would open to a certain point. I quickly turned off my shower and listened for any sounds. Not a sound. I had my phone on the sink and I decided best thing to do is call one of my buddies. I called him and he answered. He sounded very sluggish and like he didn't want to go anywhere, but as soon as I told him what I heard, it was almost like you could hear his eyes open over the phone. He set his phone down and got clothes on, then returned to the phone and started talking to me. Then I heard a loud crash of what sounded like a piece of metal. This was weird to me as I didn't have very many things in my dorm that were made of metal. My friend asked me what had happened and I told him I had no clue. I heard his front door open over the phone and then he said he's be right up. I hear loud footsteps coming down the hallway that sounded like a jog. I quickly dried off through my clothes on and received a text from my friend. He said, I'm outside your door, it's wide open and I hear heavy breathing. I replied, throw the door open and I will come out as I hear the door hit. I prepared myself by the door handle to be sure I'd do as I told him. I hear the door hit the wall and I throw the door open. I see nothing. My friend looks at me and then looks around the room. The room was untouched. We look around the room and find nothing. With both our eyes still wide open, we walk down to his room for the night, and I decide to sleep there. We wake up the next morning, and we go to check my room one more time. We open the door, and this time my pillows and blankets were thrown across my floor. We pick up the blankets and pillows before noticing that there were scratches on the wall that had never been there before. We got campus security, and they checked our room and figured it was us just messing with them and saying that we would need to pay for the damages. Luckily, my friend and I had talked him into believing us, and he called some local ghost hunters. Nothing about them was professional, and they found no evidence. Me and my friend to this day never forget what happened in dorm room 327 on USC. What do you guys think it was? My dad drove a truck between Edinburgh and London and tells this story often. He was driving down the motorway and looked to his right, saw a woman with Amos Trunchbull buns, as he describes it, staring at him with a terrified expression from a car next to him. Before he really knows how to react, the car pulls off at the next exit, and my dad, although shaken, carries on. About half an hour later, a different car with a different driver pulls alongside my dad, with the same woman in the passenger seat, with the same expression on her face. My dad thinks fuck this, and plans to pull into the next services to report as even if it's just misunderstanding, better to be safe than sorry. Anyway, the car disappears before he can get any details, and he thinks there is no point calling the police with no details, so he carries on driving. Literally about four hours later, almost in London, yet another car pulls alongside him with the same woman, same Miss Trunchbull hair, same terrified expression, except this time she appears to be screaming at my dad through the window, so my dad pulls over into a lay-by and calls the police. Apparently they have received three other calls about the same woman, car in the same area in the last few minutes. 
It is unfortunately anticlimactic, as he never heard anything more about it, but he didn't see her again, and although he kept an eye on the news, didn't see anything about it. Hopefully it's just a giant coincidence. Whilst driving from Morelia to Ciudad Hidalgo in Mexico, back in the 80s we had two ways to get to Ciudad Hidalgo, which was the National Road, or the Old National Road, which was called Mil Cumbres. Mil Cumbres basically means 1,000 curves. That stretch of road literally had 1,000 curves, so a lot of people would get motion sickness when on that road. One evening on our way back to my grandparents, who lived in Ciudad Hidalgo, my grandfather was driving and he loved taking Mil Cumbres because it had really nice views and he just really loved driving that road. But since we had the new national road, not a lot of people used that road anymore, so it was kind of desolate with the exception of passing one or two little towns. It was dusk so soon that meant that being on such a desolate road in the mountains, we would be in complete darkness on the road with no many other cars on the same stretch of road. It took two hours to get to the town on that road, so maybe 45 mins into the drive it had already gotten really dark, and as we were driving my grandfather started slowing down. I was sitting in the back seat because my grandmother was in the front with my grandfather, so I kind of stood over the front chairs to see why he was slowing down. That's when I saw a hug tree log blocking the road. My grandfather came to a stop and immediately started going in reverse to turn around and get out of there immediately. After we turned, my grandfather stepped on the gas pedal. I immediately turned around to see if I could see anything, and as we were speeding away, I could see men very dimly because the light from the tail lights of the car were starting to get dimmer and dimmer, coming from out of the adjacent trees next to tree log on the road with flashlights and guns. We were about to get robbed and thanks to my grandfather's quick thinking and taking action immediately. We avoided it. That was the last time I was ever on that road. The repeating nature of this one reminds me of one weird story back when I was in high school. It was summer and my dad's birthday, so we drove to a casino two hours away to watch a boxing match with my uncle. It finishes and we drive back the same night. We're nearing a canyon with no phone reception, so we call my mom and tell her we'll be home soon. Canyon usually takes about 30 mins with no traffic. It's around midnight, so we enter the canyon and we're all pretty tired. To keep us talking, we start telling stories, most of them creepy stories. This goes on for a while and it feels like time is passing in a haze. We pass this butte in the canyon and suddenly I get deja vu. I'm convinced we already passed that before. All of us have driven this canyon a hundred times and know the layout. We keep talking, and then we pass the same butte again. This time I point it out, and my dad and uncle notice the time. It's 1 a.m. and we're still not home, so we all start to get a bit freaked out. We stop talking and just watch the road slowly pass by. Now that we're paying attention, though, time seems to catch up. We exit the canyon around 1.15 a.m. and call my mom, who is freaked out she hadn't heard from us. We still to this day have no idea where that extra 45 minutes or so went. I've been working at Walmart for about three years now. It's not the best job, but it has decent pay and was enough to pay half the rent while my boyfriend paid the rest. One week, my manager gave me a week of closing shifts. This was really inconvenient as I had a 7.45 a.m. class on Wednesdays. It was annoying to say the least, but I sucked it up and worked my shifts as scheduled. Well, one night during that week it was ten minutes before we closed, and the only ones in the store were me and my other co-worker, Seth. Seth was counting up the registers while I was mopping the floors of all the aisles. At one point while mopping, I go down one of the aisles and see a man looking at the shelves of the arts and crafts section. This was odd as Seth and I did a sweep throughout the store to make sure everyone was gone and we didn't see this man anywhere. I politely tell him that the store is closed and that he'd have to come back tomorrow. He looks at me and profusely apologizes, telling me that he just has to pick out one more thing. After all, we had closed just a few minutes ago, so I told him to get whatever he needed but to make it quick. With that out of the way, I decided to go put the cleaning supplies away and took that time to use the restroom before I clocked out. Now, 
The restroom in the front has been out of order, which meant that I had to use the one in the back of the store. I go into the bathroom, take off my vest, and do my business. About 30 seconds later, I hear the door to the bathroom open and someone step inside. For some reason, I thought it was Seth telling me that he was leaving or something, and with that, I called out his name. However, I didn't hear a response back, and that's when I texted him asking if he were by the back of the store. He instantly responded saying no, and that he was still waiting for that other customer. That's when I look up and see an eye staring at me through the crack of the stall. I screamed the loudest I've ever had, and pulled up my pants, ramming the door, pushing the man to the ground. I ran over to the front and told Seth everything. He called the police. Thankfully, the police station wasn't too far from here, so they were able to send an officer over within two minutes. The police had told us to get out of the store while they went inside as they didn't know if he was armed. Turns out he actually had a four-inch hunting knife he had on him from our outdoor section. He had it in his back pocket, and God only knows what he was going to do with it. He was arrested, of course, and had actually done similar things before. He had been put in jail before, but was released for good behavior. This time, I'm not sure as to how long he was going to be in jail for, but I hope it's a while as that was probably the scariest thing to ever happen to me. If something feels off or wrong about something, I strongly suggest that you always trust your gut. It may just save your life. It was the summer of 2004 when I was seven years old. Let me tell you that we lived in a rented house which was very old, and there were hundreds of years old trees around it. I used to sleep in my parents' room. Once my aunt, who used to live in another city, came to our house to spend holidays with her children. Since our house was not very big, my cousins and aunt lived in my elder sibling's room. On the first night, when I went to sleep, I heard the sound of laughter coming from their room. They laughed and chatted all night. I also wanted to go and sit with them and enjoy listening to them. But as it was late night and my parents were also asleep, and I was afraid to go to my sibling's room alone. So that night I slept, but the next day I told my aunt that tonight I also want to sleep in your room and listen to stories from you. So before going to sleep, my aunt took me to her room. She placed a small bench in front of the door of the room, spread a mattress on it, and asked me to sleep on it. That room was built on the roof, and if its door was open, a view of those terrible trees could be seen outside. And the more scary thing is that they left me lying there and left the door open so that the cold, fresh air from outside could come in. As soon as the night fell, everyone went to sleep after switching off the lights after laughing and joking for a while. But my eyes kept going outside to those scary trees, and I couldn't sleep because of fear. I used to close my eyes, but then open them later due to fear. After a while, when I opened my eyes, what I saw was a human skeleton walking towards me. It was not an illusion, but I saw it in my full consciousness. I was very scared, and immediately put the blanket over my face. After lying like that for about 20 to 30 seconds, I removed the blanket from my face and saw that there was nothing. I could not even dare to go to my parents' room because of fear. Nor did I have the courage to get off the bench and go to my aunt, because I felt like if I got off the bench, that scary thing would grab me from under the bench. I know this may seem funny to you now, but at that time I was in a terrible mood, and that's why I was having such thoughts. Now I was thinking what should I do now that suddenly I saw my aunt going out to the washroom. I immediately came to life. And I asked my aunt to drop me in my parents' room. She picked me up in her arms and left me to my parents' room. Since then, I have never slept in my sibling's room. Today it has been twelve years since we left this house, but even today I remember this incident. When I was about seven, eight, I was visiting at my grandparents' house with my two cousins. The house is very secluded on the outskirts of a rural town. My mom, grandmother, and aunt were busy downstairs, in a back room spring cleaning. Us three girls were upstairs playing. Taking a lunch break, my aunt called out to us from the upstairs kitchen. We walked in the kitchen, and she asked us if we had been in her purse to play with her wallet. 
We said no, and she thought she was missing some money, around $20. Me and one cousin volunteered to look for the money in her car in case it fell out. We went to the car, looked around and found nothing. My cousin accidentally slammed the door and she told me, Shh, don't tell mom. She hates when I slam the door. I agreed and we went back upstairs. Minutes passed and we all started making sandwiches. My mother looked out the window and said, Girls, you left the car door open. We ran to the window and we kind of froze for a second. We assured them that we did not leave any car doors open and confessed to actually slamming the door that was open. At this point, things kind of starting feeing creepy. First the wallet, now the car door. After watching the car for a while, we didn't see anyone, and my mom bravely said she would close the door so the interior lights wouldn't run the battery down. Old car. When she went outside and closed the car door, the landline to the house rang. My grandmother answered, and her face turned completely white. She started yelling for mother to get in the house and lock the door now. We all got upstairs and we hunkered down in the corner of room while my grandmother called 911. My mother reported feeling someone watching her when she was closing the car door. She also thought she saw a shadow inside our Astro van, tinted windows. Someone unknown to my grandmother on the phone said, I know you're in there, and hung up. At this point we're all scared and crying, waiting 30 or 45 minutes for the cops to show up. Finally we see a police officer in the driveway, and we all run outside. He starts taking a report of what happens with the money, car door, and phone call. As he's writing everything down, I yell to my mom there's smoke coming from the top of the house, backside. My grandmother freaks thinking she left a pot of beans on the stove and maybe the kitchen caught fire. The police officer looks up and sees the smoke, calls in the fire department, and runs inside the house instructing everyone to stay outside. Moments later he comes back outside and is completely bewildered. Nothing is on fire and the smoke outside is gone. Fire department and backup police arrive. They search the house and nearby land. Nothing. To this day, we have no clue what happened, who the person was, where the money went, how they knew my grandmother's phone number, and what caused the smoke. The only speculation we made was the phone call was probably made from inside our van, as we had a mobile bag phone. I was terrified as a kid, and still shudder when thinking back on this. My niece got a little doll as a gift last year. It was from a family member who has a not-so-good reputation with us. That person has tried to use local witchcraft stuff towards my family in the past. Not that I believe much about it, but it's still family, so my sister accepted it, and we took the doll home. Everything was fine before that in the house. My bedroom is located next to the living room, while the others are a little bit far away, crossing the living room and the hallway. I only come home for holidays. I had been there for a week and everything was normal. I get to hear a lot of noise coming from the upper floor from the neighbors, because my room is directly above their backyard. The night we brought the doll, everything was quiet because it was the day after New Year's. Everybody was sleeping after the celebrations, and I was on my laptop talking to some friends. Suddenly, I hear footsteps right outside my bedroom. It didn't bother me because it could have been my sister's husband. They were heavy footsteps, like boots or men's shoes. It sounded like they were crossing the hallway, then the living room and finished on the kitchen. Immediately, I heard the water on the kitchen sink running and the sound of dishes being washed. It was odd because it was 1.15 a.m., but it could have been someone washing the baby bottles. I kept on listening. After five minutes, I heard my niece's playground being dragged from the hallway where it was kept to the living room. It does a very distinctive noise, and I'm 100% sure that was what I heard. The noise kept going for a good ten minutes or so. I wrote my sister to find out if everything was fine, but got no response. After that, I kept hearing this footsteps. My dog was very nervous and barked at me when I tried to open the door to check out what was happening, so I stayed in the room. I checked the time. It was 1.43 a.m., and the sounds were still going, until they suddenly stopped. I went to sleep, trying not to think about it. The next morning, my sister calls me on the phone and tells me to get out of my room. I did. I went to the hallway, and my mom, sister, 
and her husband were there. My sister asked me if I had put my niece's stroller in front of her bedroom door, and if I had moved the playground station. I said no and told them all about the noises. I thought they weren't going to believe me, but it turns out that when my sister came out of her bedroom in the morning, she found the stroller moved, she put it in the right place and went to get the baby bottles and back to the room. After that, her husband got out to drink some water and found the stroller again in front of the door, moved it, and on his way back asked my sister why she had put the stroller in front of the bedroom door. They noticed there was something very weird about the situation, saw my texts from last night and decided to call me. We started to freak out a bit, and I randomly grabbed the doll that was on the stroller. I noticed a strong smell emanating from it, like dry saliva. It was nauseating. It wasn't there the night before, and nobody had touched the thing. It was still in the gift bag. My sister's husband got scared about that fact and decided to throw away the doll. That night, everything was calmed again. I was 14. It was an average night, around 9 o'clock p.m. Me and my little cousin are at his house. I'm babysitting for the night while my mom and aunt are shopping, and my dad and uncle are at the movie theater, so we're sitting there and I was feeling really strange. Something was wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it, so I just kept watching TV with my cousin. The feeling wasn't going away, so I got up and walked to the back door to lock it. When I came back through the kitchen, I saw what was causing my weird feeling. In the window, there was a very decrepit and homeless-looking man, just staring into the window, looking at my cousin. Protective mode turned on. I pretended like I didn't see the guy, and I told my little cousin that we needed to go upstairs because our parents would be home soon and they wouldn't want him to be staying up late. So I went upstairs and put him to bed, knowing damn well that there was a man outside that wanted in. I was about 125 pounds and 5'8 at that time, and I played football for my school. If I remember correctly, I went downstairs and straight into the kitchen and grabbed one of those meat tenderizing hammers, turned back to the window where I saw him before. He was not there. I ran back to the front door and checked that it was locked. Both the deadbolt and the knob were locked. Ran back upstairs with my meat tenderizer and went into my cousin's room and sat down in front of the door. He asked me what I was doing, and I said that he didn't need to worry about it, and that he should keep his head low. I called the cops, and then my dad and uncle cops would take half an hour, and my dad and uncle were forty-five mins away. Then I hear a window shatter, and the sound of heavy boots walking around on the main floor. I told my cousin to say calm, hide under the covers, and to keep silent. I could hear the guy walking around downstairs. It was horrifying. I gripped that damn meat tenderizer and waited. About five minutes pass, and then I hear the boots walking upstairs. At this point, I was having a freaking heart attack. My cousin's door is no more than ten feet from the stairs. I heard him opening the doors to my aunt and uncle's room, then the bathroom. He walked back downstairs, and I heard him open the door to the basement. Fifteen minutes later, the police showed up and burst into the house. Turned out the guy was loose from a mental hospital one province away. I nearly had to battle a mental case who was about ten feet away from me and the wooden door that was between him and me. Ten years ago, when I was a skinny little seventeen-year-old, I was hiking the rural side of a levee with a friend who was even more skinnier than I was. It was a long, long walk into the woods, and for about an hour or more we hadn't seen anyone else just trees and foliage. We finally stumbled upon a huge nest-looking area. It was so random and out of place, so we investigated. There was paper and cloth everywhere, torn magazine pages, old clothes, cans, everything piled into one huge mess. We assumed maybe people drove their truck out here and dumped their trash, so we just turned to leave, but in that very moment, we saw a tall, rugged man wearing all black staring right at us. He was maybe more than 6FT, had shaggy, unkept hair, and looked dirty and disturbed. He stood 15 feet away, and he was just staring and silent. My friend didn't say something, so I said, Hi, do you live here? Is this your stuff? And he only nodded yes, and then we slowly backed away and left. He just stared at us until we could no longer see him anymore, and then we picked up speed to get back to civilization. 
I was camping up in Heber, Arizona with my brothers and my dad. I was 15 at that time and we were deep in the woods, far from most other camps. Me and my brothers had our own tent whilst my dad had a separate one not far off. He likes to give us our privacy while we were camping. We would usually run around a bit at night before going to bed, entering our camp to sleep at about 11 p.m. One night we were playing hide and seek when we heard a branch snap a few yards from us. We assumed it was an elk or something since they were pretty common in our area. I called for my youngest brother who was still hiding and he revealed himself to be hiding behind a branch pile not super far from where the noise originated. We went to the tent and I decided since it was already pretty late that we should just go to sleep. The next morning I went to check the spot for elk prints since I found them pretty fascinating. Instead I found large cat prints. I knew they were cat prints because they had the four toe pads and the large center pad as well. Such large footprints mean that they were not of a cat, but of a mountain lion. I had always wanted to see a mountain lion, but it never happened. But at that time I was so scared that I was praying that he would not come in front of me. More frighteningly, those footprints were there where my youngest brother was hiding, separated from us. And if the lion had seen my younger brother there, who knows what he would have done to him. We stopped playing hide and seek at night to avoid those types of situations and we actually set up a roll call system to ensure everyone was together at night. Now I know the mountain lion didn't see him, but still, the danger felt very real, and I worried that if I hadn't heard him, I might have lost my brother. I was in the seventh grade. I was home alone in my house. My parents were gone for the day, and it was a weekend. It was cold outside, and I decided to do homework. I sat down at the kitchen table and laid out my books and notebook. To my left in the small house was the hallway. If you walk down the hallway on the right side is the bathroom and then my bedroom. On the left side of the hallway is my parents' bedroom and my brother's bedroom. That's it. Small house. My brother worked all the time and was a lot older so he wasn't home either. The house was dead silent. I was working on homework and everything was fine and I was enjoying the time alone. From the end of the hallway, a woman said my name. At first I thought that it's just an illusion because it was very quiet in the house. But I heard my name again, and it was my childhood nickname. And only my family members knew my nickname, so it was certain that it was the voice of someone from my family. But who? No one was at home. My blood ran cold and I froze. I looked to my left to the end of the hallway and saw nothing. In one swift movement, I quietly closed my books and grabbed my jacket as my heart was in my throat. I started to cry with fear. I headed directly out the back door without looking back. I went to the garage from back door, sat and watched the back door to see if anyone came out of the house, although it would be impossible for anyone to be in the house other than myself, because my family were the only people who had been home all day. I sat there shivering for hours until my parents got home. As soon as they pulled into the driveway, I met them and told them what had happened. They checked the house and found nothing and said it was my imagination. My mother still lives in the house, and I live with her to help her now that she's elderly. My father died several years ago. Mom always heard Dad calling her name from the living room and talks about it often. She would go into the living room to ask him what he wanted, and he hadn't called her name. She still says it's her imagination. I was living in my first apartment alone in college in 2015. It was a Friday night and I was on Skype playing video games with friends. It was like midnight and there was knock on my door. I looked through the peephole and saw someone from my complex I had spoken to a few times on the other side of the door looking nervous and scared. I opened the door but kept the door chains on and asked him what was going on. He told me someone was passed out on the stairs and looked sick, and he had heard me talking on my Skype call through the door, so he knocked on my door for help. I went out into the hall with him and he showed me the person passed out in the stairs. It was my across the hall neighbor. He was obviously very, very drunk. The other guy at the complex reached down to help him up and the neighbor pulled a messy swing at him, missed completely. We talked him down and managed to get him up the stairs to his door 
the drunk guy throwing sloppy swings every now and again at us. He took like ten minutes finding the right key for his door. Every time we tried to help him, he would get angry and try to punch us. He got into his apartment, closed and locked the door, and we heard him collapse on the ground on the other side. We called the non-emergency line wondering if this guy had alcohol poisoning or if he had drove home. No one was with him, so we had no idea how he got back home, and he seemed drunk enough for it to be bad. Non-emergency came out and banged on the door for a good while, before the drunk guy managed to unlock it, and I heard an ambulance come and they took the drunk man to the hospital. I received a call from the police the next day saying he had to be hospitalized and his stomach pumped because of alcohol poisoning. Me and that other guy probably saved his life by helping him and getting him taken to a hospital. However, they also found a gun on this man. He was a criminal and not supposed to own a firearm and definitely did not have a permit to carry it around. He came back with it on him from wherever he was drinking. The cops said it was probably a good thing he was as drunk as he was because he forgot he had a gun on him, so he was throwing sloppy punches instead of pulling a gun on us when he was consistently angry at us through the encounter. I definitely could have died that night. This happened to some friends of mine in Sydney, Australia. We used to take some bottles of beer with us and go for a hike about four kilometers into the bush to the middle of nowhere to drink without worrying about getting into trouble. And we used to sleep in our sleeping bags under the stars without setting up camp. So one afternoon, my friends, without me this time, headed off with beer to the usual camp spot we'd use. Being young and stupid, no one checked the weather forecast, otherwise they'd have no heavy rain was on the way. In the middle of the night, five drunk teenagers left the campsite to shelter in caves nearby. These caves were located high up on the banks of the Hawkesbury River. Soaked from the rain and cold, they started to dig a fire pit. Unfortunately, they dug up human remains. They were too drunk to return home, so spent a miserable night in the rain waiting for dawn. They didn't even dare to stay anywhere near the caves. In the morning, they called police. The police investigated and discovered the remains were in very old Aboriginal burial site and were relocated to avoid being accidentally disturbed again. I'm a grown woman now, but when I was 11, I lived with my dad who had just gotten a gig as a temporary principal for a junior high school in a semi-rural area. He had to start the job fairly quickly, so a kind teacher at the school let us rent his basement apartment. It was pretty sweet. The house was right next door to the school. Our landlord was a well-liked teacher with a wife and a daughter my own age. One evening, my dad had to pop out to his office to fix some things. This was in 1999, so we weren't all connected online, but I was lucky to have my own mobile phone, without internet, obviously. I didn't expect to use it, as my dad is hearing impaired and usually didn't notice his phone ringing. Anyways, I expected him back in a few hours. No stress. I'm a big girl. There's a knock at the door. I can see it's the landlord, and he's also my school teacher. So I open the door and let him in. He just has a few questions, and he sits down in the couch. We talk a little, but I start feeling something's off. He seems a little drunk. His questions get invasive, and suddenly he gets up to give me a hug. I don't want a hug, and I got scared and managed to break away. He was trying to keep his grip on me. I actually start moving towards the door, but he blocks me. I am now severely freaked out, and I keep moving around the apartment while small talking about school and trying not to let my fear show. He is telling me not to be scared, and that he's my teacher, and just wants to get to know me better. This goes on for about half an hour. My dad suddenly comes home. He had a bad feeling. He immediately notices our landlord is drunk and tells him to get out. I told my dad everything, and we kept the door locked from then on. My dad had some acute health issues shortly after, and I had to stay with relatives. After he got well, we moved to a new place. However, we learned that a few weeks later, our landlord got arrested. He had been found at a gas station chugging denatured alcohol and it turned out that he had been abusing and raping his wife and 11-year-old daughter for years. 
I was going over to my mom's house for dinner one night because my parents are divorced. My sibling and I went into the house and saw our mom and her boyfriend sitting on the couch with a gray gift bag with a doll in the side of it in front of them on a coffee table. She asked me if I wanted these old dolls in the bag. My mom used to be a secretary at a school, and a woman came in with three dolls in a bag. The lady apparently said to my mom to give them to a family that will never play with the dolls and just use them for decoration. I said that I wanted the dolls because I thought they were pretty. The first doll wore an emerald green dress and a matching hat with a black feather. The other two I don't remember much about all I know is that they had blonde hair and one of them had an umbrella. After that we went with our mom and her boyfriend to a nearby pizza place. After we ordered, a small black feather fell onto my empty plate. I quickly brushed it off my plate and looked up at the ceiling, but saw nothing that it could have come from. Later that night I was back at my dad's house, and me and my sibling were playing with the dolls. I know that the lady said not to play with the dolls, but me and my sibling were pretty young, and we really wanted to play with them. Around midnight, while I was sleeping, I got woken up by my bed, shaking violently. The dolls were next to my bed in the gray bag that I got from my mom. I looked down into the bag at the dolls, and they were all there. I brushed it off as nothing because I was tired, and I went back to sleep. The next day I went to school early in the morning, because I went to the same school that my mom worked at, and we were some of the only people there because she had to open up the school. My mom had me drop off some papers to a classroom. When I got to the classroom that I needed to drop of the papers at, the doorknob of the door that was across for the one I needed to go into started to shake. The doorknob was locked, and it sounded like someone was trying to get into the hallway from the classroom. I quickly dropped of the papers and went back to the office where my mom was. I told her what happened, but she said it was probably nothing. The day after early in the morning, I told my mom I didn't want the dolls anymore, so we took them to the school that morning and gave them away to a kid of someone that worked at the school. No other occurrences has happened since I gave the dolls away. I am not sure that this is some weird hallucination that my child brain came up with, or something more sinister. If anyone has any explanation of what could have happened, or have had a similar experience to me, please feel free to share in the comments.